thank you very much for joining us today, this evening, with myself, Ross McKenzie. I'm the host, and Dr. Emma Baxter, who you've heard is chatting with, who will be doing the talk tonight on temperament and welfare. So these, this is the first of four webinars, small bite size, as we call them, and they're based on pigs, of course, small scale pig keeping. So this week we're starting with temperament and welfare. Next week on the 8th of October, eight o'clock, we're looking at health, pig health and veterinary. We've got Hannah Orr speaking next Thursday. And then we've got two more. We've got feeding on the 15th of October, eight o'clock. Simple to remember, just a week, week ahead. And then we'll finish off with breeding and Emma's coming back to do that. So that's going to be hopefully a very exciting four sessions. I hope you can join us for all four. Just before we start, I just want to say about inexperience and those with no experience. We hope these webinars will give you a good insight into keeping pigs and the do's and don'ts. There's obviously some of you here who are very, who may have a good experience, so that's great. On the chat, please get in touch as throughout the, the evening. But sometimes you can you can get a bit bogged down on the internet with with certain sites that can give you bad information. So we want to make sure that tonight you will get the best of information and please spread the word about these webinars if you enjoy it. I'm sure you will. I'm absolutely positive you will. A, a, a little bit about Emma, she'll tell you about herself, obviously, but I am involved. I work for the SAC Consulting. Emma works for SRUC Research. We're all the same band, but we've got different names at the moment. We won't go into that, but We've be, both been involved in the Pig Information Group, which has brought myself an advisor and Emma and research and vets and teachers together. And it's been a really useful group. You learn so much from research, especially. They have so much information to give. So we'll go straight on to that, Emma, if you want to unmute yourself and get ready, because yep. I think we're ready to go. And please okay. enjoy the evening. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Ross. Hopefully, I'll just double check that uh, everyone can see my screen. Um, you should be able to see uh, <laughs> the title page. Um, I'll get Ross to jump in if there's any any problems because I can't necessarily the ch see the chat. I can just see myself at the moment, which is always a bit distressing, and uh, and my chat. So, as um, as Ross said, I'm uh, I'm Emma Baxter. Um, I'm one of the researchers in the animal behaviour and welfare team at SIUC. And I've worked with pigs for about uh, over 16 years now, um, both with commercial indoor producers um, and also a lot of the outdoor producers as well. So hopefully some of my experience I can kind of feed into this talk. And I've sort of called it pig welfare and um, and temperament generically. Ooh, let's just see if I can. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a lot about uh, pig signals. Um, and you'll probably know already if you have pigs that they are highly expressive animals. They will signal their intent to each other and us with their body language, um, with their vocalizations. And definitely there are certain breeds that um, have specific temperament traits and, and often on the uh, breeding websites, they'll say um, the different characteristics that the animals have both behaviorally and in terms of kind of meat uh, quality um, traits. Uh, but by and large, in terms of behaviours, pigs are very similar. Um, they're actually very similar to their wild uh, boar ancestors. And I'm not going to go into the different um, temperaments of the different breeds in this talk. I'll talk a little bit about uh, that on October the 22nd. But just to say, individuals also have different temperaments. Um, you may find that already with the pigs that you have. You'll have some that might be quite calm, others that are bold, some that are proactive and some that are reactive. What we do know is that um, where there are similarities, um, we can learn how to recognize certain behaviors. And by doing that and understanding their behavior, you should be able to help you to prevent welfare problems and identify them when they do arise. 
So first of all, I'm going to talk to you um, a bit about um, the different pig sensors and, and what's important to them. Um, they have incredibly well-developed sensors and their primary sense organs are actually their smell and their hearing. So, so different to us as humans that rely heavily on sight. Um, their snout um, is highly dexterous. That's their primary sense organ. They use that to communicate with each other, but also, also with us. So they'll look to sniff and touch things whenever they can. And that is in part because they really don't have um, very great vision uh, at all, especially night vision. So they are inactive in the dark. Um, this is quite a, a good diagram by um, Anthony Dalmo and colleagues. There's a, I put a link to their um, article about pig vision, which is, if you're interested in these things, it's quite an interesting article. But it shows you what you know their their scope and what happens with pigs is they prioritize their lateral monocular vision, which is their panoramic, and, and therefore increase their panoramic vision. So they have about a 310 degree panoramic vision. And that's done um, basically because they uh, in the wild they are a, a prey species as well as a bit of a predator sometimes. So this means they can detect danger, um, food, and other pigs. But it also means that they've got a decreased bifocal vision, and that means they have difficulty calculating distances. And that can be a welfare problem. Um, you might find, for example, that pigs try and find small gaps in a fence that you think is a perfectly a tiny gap, but they might try and think it's appropriate to squeeze through it. And it's, they're, they're just finding it difficult to calculate their distance. And other welfare problems you might find because they don't have particularly good sight is um, with electric fence training when they're moving from light to dark and dark to light, and certainly sudden appearance of objects. So um, we used to have uh, slight worries on the outdoor units with hot air balloons because they would suddenly appear um, from out of nowhere and then make this big whoosh of noise. Um, whereas if, if you hear just, a, if pigs would be able to orientate themselves if a plane was coming overhead, but a hot air balloon was the scariest thing, and the other thing to remember about pigs is they have very thick necks and it's quite difficult for them to look up. So trying to orientate themselves um, using vision is very difficult. So we need to um, kind of try and find ways to prevent a welfare issue there. So what is it that you can do to do that? Well, the first thing is that you should give pigs the time to orientate themselves um, with their primary senses. So when there's a problem for humans, they might search out the source of that problem. But with pigs, when there are changes in their environment, they will try and sniff it out. That is why they take their time moving everywhere. The other thing is, um, unless they're running for food, of course. Um, the other thing is uh, avoid having areas of light and shade in things like handling chutes or anywhere you want the pig to move to. So if you want to move, move it into a different paddock or something like that, or, or load it onto a ramp, if you've got a sudden shaft of light, the likelihood is the pig will not want to go across that shaft of light. And that's because from the pig's vision point of view, they're probably confusing that light with a change in floor surface, surface, and that's making them quite nervous about moving. And some of you might know by now that if a pig does not want to move somewhere, it won't. So it doesn't have a flight distance. It's not like a, um, any of the ruminant species. And so thinking about pig senses and movement is obviously very important for welfare then. Again, this is another um, really quite a nice diagram by um, uh, Tony Dalmo, and it shows you here the blind spots of the pig and where you might want to position yourself if you want to move the animal forward uh, and limit things like it's an escape, its escape zone. But whenever you're trying to move pigs, prepare, always prepare. In fact, prepare for most things is always a good idea before you even try doing them. Position yourself correctly, move the pigs as a group. They're a social species. They want to move together. They will follow each other. If you're um, going to use any kind of aids, which we, we recommend you do, especially with the, the big um, adult animals, um, use handling boards, pig handling boards to kind of block areas. Certainly don't go negative. Don't use any sticks or prods. And goads are illegal. So if you see anybody with a, a goad, um, that would be an illegal practice. Um, but Pigs are actually very quick to learn to follow a bucket of food, um, especially if they're restricted fed, which most adult animals are. So there's quite a famous quote, which you've probably heard from uh, Winston Churchill that says, I'm fond of pigs, dogs look up to us, cats look down on us, but pigs treat us as equals. And I suspect he was thinking about their intelligence when um, he made that comment. And certainly they are 
very intelligent animals. They actually have the same brain index as a dog, so you can train pigs very well. They're very curious and investigative and exploratory, and they have really well-developed learning abilities. And that's um, they're all really good um, traits in an animal. But of course, there can be welfare problems when you um, have such an intelligent animal and that they can get bored quite quickly. And they may then redirect their behaviors um, in a more um, troubling way. So they might uh, manipulate each other. If they're in an environment that's particularly poor, um, they might bite each other's tails, things like that. It's very unlikely um, with this audience group that that's going to be an issue, but we do have a lot of those problems um, in intensive piggeries where the pigs aren't given very much to do. So pigs reared in enriched conditions, which I suspect all of you guys have, probably will be able to um, sort of fulfill their, their um, exploratory behavior. The other way that um, pigs are expressive and, and give off signals is through their vocalization. So they're highly vocal, and the quality and context of these vocalizations are really important to recognize. Now, unfortunately, I did make some recordings of vocalizations, but um, the particular system we're using won't um, allow, us, allow me to play them very clearly. So I'm just gonna have to describe them to you. But I pulled out their waveforms um, in decibels here of two examples of two different types of behavior um, vocalizations. They actually have similar sort of waveforms. They've got these kind of up and down uh, levels. One of them's a, a bit uh, louder and deeper. But um, these animals are vocalizing um, uh, under completely different contexts. The first one is an example of a new um, mother, a gilt. She's just farrowed and she's come round from farrowing and she's actually chuckling. They're both chuckling, but she's chuckling to her piglets softly, but actually in quite a nervous way. And it's important to recognize that because she needs, um, you don't want to disturb that behavior. She's trying to group her piglets before she lies down. And that chuckling is, is a really important communication with her piglets. And um, sometimes they can get a bit um, stressed and up and down and, and chuckle more, but um, it's something that you don't want to disturb. And then the one on the bottom is a much deeper chuckle. This is actually one of our big boars um, who loves a scratch. And when you scratch him, he makes these really deep chuckly vocalizations. And that's a very positive uh, conversation he's having. Uh, yeah, he's having with us. Other vocalizations, um, pigs will actually woof and bark. Um, they might woof when they're playful. So this particular sound wave is the woof at the end of this pig um, running to, to meet its friend. But also we find that pigs will woof when they're startled. Um, so they kind of do this barking if they're very, very startled and worried about something. Now they often come round, but sometimes that if that woof is then followed by a lot of sniffs, um, it usually means that they're, they're um, getting a bit more nervous about your presence and probably you'll find that will happen uh, every time they experience a vet. Um, anyway, some very important um, vocalizations to recognize are those of piglets, um, particularly screaming piglets. And I have uh, two um, sound waves here, decibel waves here of two piglet screams, but they're in very different contexts. But the reason I wanted to pull them out is that they are important for handling. So apologies for this picture if any of you are at all um, squeamish, but these are um, the situations that we have here. So the top sound wave is from a piglet that's being crushed by its mother and it's screaming. And of course it's screaming um, because its automatic response as soon as its um, chest is crushed is to scream. It's a survival strategy. It wants its mother to get react to that scream and get off it. And by and large, um, mothers do, and um, good mothers do. The one on the bottom is also has an intensive um, scream, and that is because it is being poorly handled. And when I mean poorly handled, it's not being mishandled, but um, for the purposes of this uh, talk, um, this person has um, held the pig too tight. So it thinks, the, the handler might think they're doing the right thing, but they're squeezing this pig as if it's being, and it thinks it's being crushed essentially. Um, so there is a real reflex with pigs to as soon as you compress their chest is to give off this scream. And in the background of these vocalizations, you actually have um, the mothers reacting to that. And it can cause a lot of stress um, for both the piglets, um, you and the mother. So that's why it's a welfare concern. And that's why I wanted to show you. So it, inappropriate handling is a real problem. That When you hold a piglet too tight, it will respond in the same way as being crushed. And that causes stress and maternal defensiveness. So what can you do? Well, 
don't handle young piglets and I know it's tempting to um, you know cradle them or handle them and they're very cute and um, it's one of the things that you know friends and family all want to see but you really do need to be very careful about how much you handle piglets especially in the first few days um, if you if you need to um, handle them for health and welfare then that's fine but try not to try to let them bond with their mother and certainly if you do handle them, don't do it in front of the sow. Um, you might know the sows really well, um, but um, they can also be unpredictable. So you need to have a separate space and ideally two people when you're, when you're um, dealing with piglets um, away from their mother. And as I've hopefully shown with that, um, those uh, pictures of the piglets before, don't squeeze a piglet or hold it too tight. Here's some example of just the ways that we, we handle piglets carefully in this sort of loose situation. So. When I was um, doing work on farrowing sows and I had to collect a piglet, I would use the shepherd's crook. I'd never get in with the sow. Even when she's quite zoned out when she's farrowing, it's a dangerous um, thing to do. Most huts have a gate on, front, on the front of them. You can you know, cradle a piglet to lift it through the hatch. For example, these um, pictures on the bottom, this is a quite a nice, uh, nice setup here where you can lock yourself in the hut in order to um, handle an animal if you had to give it medication or treatment or something like that. Other ways that you, you handle the one, the picture on the left might look a little bit brutal, but actually it's very efficient. This is us giving this piglet an iron injection. You wouldn't normally have to do this in an outdoor situation. It's unlikely that the animals will be iron deficient. But yeah, picking them up with their back leg and briefly and correctly um, handling them, they stay quiet. They don't scream when they're picked up like this. And then if you just, um, once you picked it up like that, you can support it with its chest. And again, this is the correct posture here on the right. Don't squeeze them, just light restraint and, and don't hold them for too long because they do get bothered um, quite quickly. So the other things when, in terms of pig um, communication is their body language. So pigs are obviously physically very expressive. They have um, actually have expressive um, face, uh, sorry, um, they're facially expressive as well. As I mentioned at the start, they'll signal their intent to one another. So when two unfamiliar pigs meet for the first time, they are usually quite do quite a lot of displays, so they might sniff each other, um, but they also um, might do parallel walking to assess each other's body size to see whether they need to fight each other. But they'll also, the pigs will also be signaling, signaling to you all the time, and they can actually warn with their expressions and vocalizations if they're worried or defensive. The welfare concern here is that you don't recognize the signals that they're giving. So what you can do in order to improve the situation is obviously get to know your pigs um, very well. Um, as I said at the start, in individuals, some animals are very docile, um, some are more reactive and maybe hyper reactive. And you need to get to understand their signals. So I have a little poll here. This is my point to get Ross to come in. So I've just got two pictures here and I realize it's a picture, not a video, so it's a bit trickier for you, but I just thought to you know, wake you up or uh, pull you away from the TV in the background um, is to have a look at these two sows and they've just newly farrowed and whether you can tell me um, which one out of these two do you think is uh, okay with you being there your presence the top or the bottom now I don't know if I can uh, uh, I'm gonna Hi. let so Ross are you gonna give some instruction yeah I'm just going to launch the poll so if you can either t t touch the top picture or bottom picture. The, and I'll, the question is, which one do you think is, is fine with us being there? Yeah, I, I, the poll reads which of these pigs is distressed, but oh, don't worry sorry, about that. Sorry, other way around then. <laughs> which of these pigs Whatever. is distressed? <laughs> yeah. Ah, so that's, that's the poll launched. So if you Ooh. quickly decide now is this because people of which question do people are did people answer? <laughs> i'll tell you after 71 percent voted there's like a non-committal <laughs> we'll give you a couple of more questions it's very much 82 84 yeah 30 seconds right we'll close the poll okay what's the um, what the and I'll share it now. Okay. So that's the results shared, is it? Yeah. So I so it so in the question, which one is most distressed? 
94% of you said it was the bottom pig. Yeah. So hopefully they were answering that question rather than the which one is absolutely chilled out with you, us being there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean. so now I shall do the big reveal. <laughs> <laughs> now, the whoever said the top one was correct. <laughs> so just to put these pictures, the, the next stage on from these pictures, the pig on the top got up when we were there and started to show this body language. So the picture in the middle on the top is this pig telling us, actually, I don't really want you anywhere near. And then you can see that it moves towards coming towards me and saying, do you know what? This is me giving you a warning and now I'm going to tell you to, to go away. The pig on the bottom was actually very chilled out to the point of yawning and and being um, very good about us being there and was even just happy to sort of sniff at her piglets and, and uh, she actually lay back down and suckled. Now, it's a bit annoying, a bit um, naughty of me to kind of give you just those two basic pictures. If you were there in person, you would probably be picking up not only on the body language of the animal, but also the vocalizations. But actually, with both these situations, you absolutely need to respect the animal's space, especially when the piglets are this young, because they that time is spent kind of um, bonding with the young animals and the, the pigs can suddenly change, especially if there was suddenly a scream or something like that. And actually, even later on in lactation, um, here's a picture of one of our, our older girls. These piglets are about three or four weeks into lactation and she seems perfectly chilled out but, and asleep, but actually she's always keeping our, her eye on us. Um, and it's just to kind of warn you that always look for the signals, never be completely, <laughs> completely relaxed uh, around, um, around your animals, especially new mothers, because they can be very maternally defensive. Boars, um, there, are, there are some issues with big adult boars as well but I'm not going to deal with that here. I'm going to bring that back in um, for the breeding lecture. I'm advertising that for October the 22nd. Okay, other important um, communications um, with body language that are obviously really important is to recognise health and welfare issues, particularly sickness behaviours and thermal behaviours. I call them thermal behaviours. It's basically the behaviours animals will show when they're not very happy with their environment. So obviously healthy pigs are very active and noisy and, and that's great. Um, diseased pigs will deviate from the group. So if they start to do things on their own, it usually means there may be something wrong because generally pigs like to behave um, in a similar manner. If they stop eating, if they lie down, pigs will try and bury themselves. If they, if they um, are feeling unwell, they, they can shiver and vomit. They, sometimes they look very hairy. So that one on the bottom is bloated and hairy. And although with um, rare breeds, it can be difficult to see a change in their color um, with the typical pink pigs, you can see when there's um, there's um, paleness to the skin. Their body posture is important too. So it can be very obvious when an animal is lame because it arches its back, but sometimes they can have a gastric issue and it might arch, it, arch its back as well. I suspect Hannah will talk more about um, pig diseases and things like that. But the other thing to look at is the tail. The pig's tail is incredibly expressive, especially in younger animals. And what we know is when they are feeling defensive or when they're feeling unwell is that they can clamp their tails down. So here's an example on the bottom that I've shown you. This is during feeding. So the picture on the um, left is uh, what we want to see, nice curly tails. And the picture on the right is probably indicative of there being a, a problem during feeding time in particular. One of the pigs is clamping its tail and usually that can be indicative that there's been um, redirected behavior so maybe some tail biting and that could be because um, it's not a big enough trough and they're restricted fed so what's happening is some of them are being bullied off that feed and pro probably nipping around the back end but also tail tucking can happen when there's um, sickness so it's a bit of an early warning sign so um, if you look in this pen and you did a bit quick scan of a pen um, then can you spot the one that's maybe um, going to have problems already does have problems. Well, it's this little girl here. She's clamping down her tail. You can already see that she's um, smaller than the others. So she's probably a bit of a poor doer is what we would call her. Um, she doesn't need to be pulled out at this point because maybe she doesn't have any other um, symptoms and you don't want to separate an animal unless really necessary. But certainly it's the sort of things that you should keep an eye on. Now, this is obviously a big, a big herd here, but um, just to say that the tails can be a really good indicator. I have to say when the pigs get much older, um, gravity can take over with their tails. So they don't, the big sows and boars don't always have their tails up and curly, is a little bit breed dependent. They might just hang loose, but as long as they're not tucking them under, when they're tucking them under, it can be a problem. 
I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think um, uh, Hannah will, but you know, if you've got real problems, essentially, um, there are spe special regulations for animals that are ill, but certainly contact your, contact your vet. Thermal behavior is interesting because it can it allows the pigs to tell you whether they're okay with their environment. So um, piglets are very vulnerable in particular, so they can huddle or burrow when they're cold. And obviously when the animals are hot, um, they change their behavior, they, they lie apart, they lie laterally on their side. If they're really hot, you'll find they're panting, which of course is a mechanism to reduce um, heat stress. But if they're panting, they probably are very heat stressed. So that's almost like the last thing they'll do. Um, pigs will try and seek shade, so they're forest dwellers anyway, and they can suffer from things like sunburn, particularly the typical pink pigs. And they'll try themselves to create a wallow. So you might find that they flood or break the drinkers um, if they don't have a wallow already. They'll certainly try and root soft ground. Obviously, there are things you can do before you even have your pigs. Make sure that you have a good, good land and soil selection and you place your huts in the correct place. Um, so here's some typical examples of, of good and bad placement. Um, think about your sunrise and sunset positions, particularly for the summer. So if you don't have a shaded area that you can keep the pigs in, um, think about the positioning of the hut so that they can maybe use that to um, cool themselves off in, but also in terms of the position of um, where the wind comes from for cold stress, all of these things just always um, think about um, you know, what the animal's going to be doing in that paddock. Certainly create wallows and provide uh, shelter. The picture on the right is actually one of these wallow makers that you can get, you can plug them into um, your piping and they'll create a wallow for you. I'm just gonna finish with going over a, a little bit uh, more about just general behaviors rather than um, pig signals, because I think it's also quite important to recognize. So. Um, just to say that um, the pigs have not changed very much from their wild boar ancestors. So we know that they're a social species. We know they engage in a lot of exploratory behavior and they would prefer a forestry habitat. Ideally, they would be in small groups um, where a hierarchy is maintained within that group and this will actually avoid conflict. So there's usually a, a boss female and she's usually the largest one. Um, the, the males tend to drift in and out of the groups just for reproduction. And pigs were domesticated about 9,000 years ago. And morphologically, there have been quite a lot of changes, you know, through um, breeding, through genetic selection and, and desired traits that we want in terms of temperament, yes, but also meat quality. Um, but in terms of full behavior changes, although we've made them more docile and less fearful of humans, we actually haven't changed their behavior um, very much at all. So many of the behaviors you would actually observe in wild boar as well. And if you have knowledge of natural behavior and there's a deviation from natural behavior, you should be able to prevent or identify welfare problems, which is what I said at the start. So because they're social, it means they're very gregarious and they have this strong rank order. They like to lie together, interact together, and they're led by this older, uh, bigger female. The young piglets are born into the group, away from the group, and then they get reintegrated. And all of this can happen in a very harmonious way without fighting. The welfare problem comes um, when you suddenly mix animals together that don't know each other, or there is um, a, a space issue um, when you're bringing different groups of animals together. So the welfare concern is, with social behavior is inappropriate mixing, but equally pigs do not want to be on their own. So isolation can be a real problem. And aggression is perfectly natural, actually. It appears mainly as an anti-predatory um, strategy but um, under kind of domestic conditions, it's more likely to occur when you've got competition for resources. So when you're um, feeding the animals, um, if there's not enough feed or enough space, they might fight over that. They will fight to establish or reestablish a dominance hierarchy. And obviously both of these things can cause injury and stress. So avoid mixing unfamiliar pigs. So if you're buying your animals, buy them as a stable group, so similar ages, same litter potentially, would be good. Um, if you are going to mix unfamiliar animals, then the amount of space and the quality of that space is key. So pigs won't always fight, um, but they do need the space to assess each other and communicate by reading body language and sniffing. So when you put two unfamiliar pigs together, it's not necessary that they will definitely fight. If one of them thinks they can't win it, 
they'll find other strategies in order to assert their dominance, or they might just lie down together and be perfectly happy as friends. But you just have to have these things in mind. Certainly provide plenty of space, especially when giving limited resources such as feeding. And it goes without saying, hopefully, that water should be available um, ad libitum. Um, other welfare problems in terms of social behaviour is the opposite, isolation. That can be incredibly stressful for the pigs. Um, you might need to isolate because they have sickness or injury. You might need to separate your boar from the reproductive females. Um, again, I'll go into reproduction a little bit more on October 22nd. Certainly pre-farrowing, there needs to be separation of those expectant mothers. So what can you do to reduce the welfare problem here? Well, the first thing I'll say is please don't buy just one pig. Uh, you guys might all have pigs already, um, but some people want to get a pig. And I always say, well, you don't just get one <laughs> um, because they are a social species. If you need to separate them out, consider the possibility of a buddy pig to go with it. So an example at the top here is this one of these pigs has a leg injury and it's got a buddy pig with it. Um, but certainly consider um, fence line contact, line of sight, the ability certainly to smell and hear other pigs and that will reduce the stress when you have to separate them out. Um, separating and reintegrating is going to happen when you're farrowing. Um, I'm not going to go into this in a big detail because farrowing is a very big topic anyway, but it is completely natural for the expectant sow to want to isolate herself from the group. She's meant to do this, hormones kick in, she wants to go away, create a nest, build a nest, and spend time with her young for the first um, few weeks before she's reintegrated. The welfare concern is that she's not able to do this. If sows fire in a group, um, this can increase uh, piglet mortality. Um, we produced, uh, Ross and I produced a booklet all about kind of uh, farrowing um, guide, kind of stock person's guide to good health and husbandry around farrowing. Um, get in touch with Ross if you want one of these or me, um, we can even probably send you a link to the PDF. And there's far more information about kind of the do's and don'ts of um, farrowing. And as, as I said, I'll talk about it a bit more at a later date. But certainly then you, what you need to think about later on at weaning is um, you need to reintegrate pigs. And whenever you're mixing or reintegrating pigs, just remember those mixing rules. They need plenty of space, plenty of resources, feed, water, um, forage even, something to distract them while they get to know each other again. And, and this was quite a ex good example of this. These pigs, these pigs were reintroduced um, to their aunt, if you like, with their mother, and there was plenty of space. They opened up parts of the field to make it far more exciting to go and be in the forage. And there was plenty of time for them to kind of settle in together without any uh, aggression. Just a lot of sniffing. I'm just gonna uh, finish before we sort of do questions, just to say, know the rules is an important thing. Um, in terms obviously of health and welfare and pig rearing, um, there is information out there. Uh, you, As uh, owners of animals, you're under the, exactly the same regulations as typical um, commercial farmers. Um, within the legislation, which is you know quite dense, there's a whole load of requirements about accommodation, inspections, things like that. But, also, but very useful to distill it down to these codes of practice for, for the welfare of pigs. Um, within there, there are specific sections on the outdoor husbandry systems and the do's and don'ts in terms of um, practice. And I suspect, again, maybe Hannah will go over this a little bit more with you as well. But I just wanted to flag up that there are rules um, with, respect to, with respect to welfare. It just remains for me to acknowledge uh, my friends at Eco Indigo and their lovely pigs, who you saw a lot of during uh, this presentation. Um, the SRUC farm and technical staff and the pigs our pigs as well. Um, Marianne Farish, who's uh, responsible for lots of things, but uh, a lot of the photography you'll have seen in this as well. And that was a quick whistle stop tour. Any questions? I shall. Thanks. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Emma. That I was, keep to uh, time. <laughs> time was very good. That was just uh, 30 minutes. That was excellent. Oh, okay. I'm going to be yeah, in trouble, probably. not 20. <laughs> no, no, that was bang on what we wanted. And the, the presentation, I, I, I was just checking, we had, we had uh, 40, we peaked up 40 attendees. So Ooh. that's excellent. So thank <laughs> you so much for coming along tonight into our Thanks, virtual. Everyone. We've got, I can yeah. see we've got questions. Should I stop? Is it useful for me to stop sharing screen or should I just keep that in the background? That's fine in the background, yeah. Okay. 
Right, I'll ask the questions. Okay. Uh, and obviously you're our expert. Could you explain what a gold is? You, you mentioned using a gold. Yeah, okay. So um, electric, an electric goad is essentially a, um, a, it's a stick with an electric shock on the end of it. Um, it they've been banned for a long time, except for there are specific um, thing uh, in terms of slaughterhouses and transport, whereby you could possibly use um, a goad to move um, boars that won't move or move sows that won't move, but it's, it's really frowned upon. It's the last possible resort, and it's essentially if there's a, a dangerous situation with moving the, uh, the pigs. Um, transport vehicles, uh, big commercial transport vehicles can, can carry them, um, but they, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to happen. <laughs> it really is a last resort. Ross, yeah. I don't know if you want to come in on that at all. I totally agree. I see them being used, and it was just through frustration people use them. Uh, sometimes you just need to relax and go again when you're loading rather than yeah. work them up. It's, it's just through frustration. It is. It's through frustration and also not understanding a pig's um, behaviour. Yeah. So yeah. what you find yeah. is you'll find that they're goading the ones at the back of a long line of pigs and it's because yeah. a sow at the front has come across a strip of light in front of her and she, or she's lame or something. So it's, um, it's yeah, it's inappropriate, usually inappropriate use. It would have to be a real a threatening ah. situation for the stock person. That's right. And uh, one of the one of the lorry drivers, I remember, I used to work for a pig company, and he used to chase me with it, then he's going to zap me, which I didn't enjoy. Yes. <laughs> that was that was that was welfare problem too. But he never used it on the pigs, which was wonderful. He just it was there in the lorry, so he used to yeah. try and so get me. What you find is that they quite often use um, empty feed bags to kind of just um, move pigs along that won't move, which is, you know, it's still a yeah. little bit negative, but it, it does work. That's right, yeah. This is from your neighbour, Emma. Do Tamworth piglets... Oh, you've missed one. You've missed one, though, Ross. You've missed one. Where did I... What's going... Hang on. Oh, that's... that's uh... John John was heading off. He's just wondering if this was being recorded. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. So it will be, yeah. Yeah, so this is from your neighbour. Do Tamworth piglets squeal more than Oxford Sandy Blacks? <laughs> oh, that's a temperament question. No, I mean, I th I think uh, it, it's a slightly age dependent. So what you'll find is that um, any piglet will squeal when it's being having its uh, chest compressed at all it's almost it's like a reaction straight away you do find some pigs are chattier than others um, when they are older but squealing uh, happens when they're excited as well it can sound when they're suckling it can quite often sound like they're screaming and uh, that's across all that's across all breeds yeah the next question what should you do if a pig is getting bullied or it's tail bitten and you don't have many pigs. Um, so. so, yeah, so I think it's important to, well, if, it, if its tail is bitten and it's, um, there's blood, you, you need to stop the blood, if you like. And usually it will, um, it, it can look like a lot of blood if they've taken the tip off the tail because it's uh, very uh, vascular at the end there and it will dry up quickly, but you, you need to then dry it up. So um, you'll probably have some teramycin spray um, which I know is an antibiotic spray, which again isn't ideal, but it does actually work to dry the wound up and it will give some protection um, at that stage. So dry up the wound. Um, if you'd hope it isn't then continuing to get bullied, but if it is, you need to think about why it's being bullied. Is it being bullied because, um, because of the blood or is it being bullied because of the resources that you have there? So do you have enough feeder space? Do you have enough water space? Um, is there enough forage and other things for the pigs to do so they don't pick on that one bullied piglet or pig? Um, so yeah, it's usually if that sort of thing happens, it's happening because um, the, they're uh, fighting over resources, or you know, the, the pig is um, the pig with the bitten tail is drinking and the other one wants to come in or something like that. I hope that maybe answers your your question. 
Excellent. Integration of gilts and older sows, what is best? Um, so I should say when you're integrating, it's don't mix in one pig with a whole load of other pigs um, because that's that one pig will get will get bullied quite badly. Um, it's best to do it. Uh, it's best to integrate as a group if you can. So you've put integration of gilts, which makes me think that you've got um, a group of gilts. Um, what will happen probably is if they've got, um, if there's a clear size differential and you've got, let's say you've got uh, two gilts and two sows, you can mix them together, as I've said, um, with all of the correct resources in place. So make sure that there's plenty of um, hut space, plenty of shelter space, straw, forage, etc. What will happen is the sows will probably um, bully the gilts a bit um, or uh, certainly do quite a lot of posturing, but because they are older and bigger, there probably won't be any fighting. Um, that's what I would say. That it, automatically, they are the top of the ladder, and the others just have to learn to be the bottom of the ladder, and then they will they will settle down. It, it's not going to be a, con, a consistent problem, um, especially if you give them enough feed spread about and everything like that. There will be there will be a bit narky with each other every so often, but um you yeah you you do it in an area that's got plenty of resources around it and yeah you you can mix them um mix them together as as a as a whole group and expect there to be a, a, a you know a bit of posturing but hopefully no no full on aggression and they will settle down but never mix one pig with lots of others i don't know if you want to come in on that as well ross or whether you're no i agree totally with you you said it correct yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, through what I've learned very much. The other good thing is you could do, difficult. yeah, you could do gradual as well. So fence line contact is important. So kind of get them to start to learn to sniff each other and get used to each other's smells. So you're not, so they're almost integrating um, olfac in an olfactory way before you, you fully mix. Yeah, we used to, indoors, we used to use, they say, oh, she said, oh, put them in a big pen yep. where there's so much room and little things to keep them occupied, such as yep. more straw and things like that. It's Yeah, it's definitely. And and also, yeah. I should say, make sure there's nowhere for them to injure themselves or off or on when they are trying to escape each other, because if the gilts get worried, they will run away from the sows, or if you have a bully, the gilt, the sows will run away. So make sure there's yeah. no sharp ed edges, that they're their um, feet are supported. You know, if you're an outdoor outdoor field or whatever, usually it's fine because there's a lot of the, there's a lot of give in the ground. But if you're mixing in some sort of an, an indoor building in concrete or something like that, put plenty of straw down because it protects their legs. The sows yeah. might mount the gilts and vice versa and things like that. So lots of protection when you're mixing. Excellent. How do we get a copy of that? of the legislation documents i will <laughs> I'll drop one round i will yeah. post uh I will, no, i'll get ross to post um on the fast website yeah is that okay yeah. ross yeah. Put on the we'll links to the, the legislation and the um welfare codes so the welfare codes in england have been approved and posted the scottish ones are still under con consultation but essentially it's very very unusual and we don't have to get into a whole political debate about it. It's very unusual for the Scottish codes um, to be different to the English codes with respect to um, these kind of welfare things. Um, certainly, there are no changes in actual legislation. There just might be some slightly different um, wordings for certain things. But the codes of recommendations are, 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 um, are pretty good. They're, they pull out the big bits of legislation that you need, um, and then they give you tips, you know, basically best practice tips the whole way through as well. Great. So yeah, we'll um, we'll post some links, eh? That's right. And of course, sorry if I should mention the website is fars.scot and you'll get you'll be able to bring up so much good. There's lots of excellent podcasts as such. This is a a good question. When we farrow, we use usually spend the first three days sleeping in the shed and making sh making sure the piglets aren't being crushed. The sow seems happy with us being there. But are we interfering too much? <laughs> That's a tricky one. That is a tricky one. I mean, yeah. you know, good on you in a way. If you're, I think if you, uh, if your sow's comfortable and, you know, it's not, 
it's not unusual to have farrowing supervision. Generally with the kind of rare breed animals, we let them get on with it because they're bred with a lot of maternal instinct in mind. And if you have um, a farrowing environment with, um, you know, deep, deep straw and sloped walls and things like that to help her lie down without crushing them, then that, um, that can be quite protective in itself. Um, uh, farrowing supervision in, in typical commercial sheds um, usually involves inducing them and they, they're usually in farrowing crates so, and you still lose piglets. Um, but you, I mean, as long as you're not obviously interfering with that, that mother young um, bond, then um, yeah, be sensible about it. If you've done this, if, if wonder if this is the person that's raised, uh, <laughs> that just had an 11 wieners. No, maybe not. Um, no. Yeah, so uh, you don't need to. I mean, it, pigs pigs are a litter species, and um, this sounds a bit brutal, but with litter species, they produce more offspring than they intend to rear. So this is why you get runt pigs. This, these are insurance offspring. Now, it'd be great if everything survived, and generally rare breed pigs are more robust than your hybrid pigs, and so you can get them all the way through to weaning, you know, so many born alive and so many weaned that's great but um you know it's not unusual for a pig to lie down on a piglet they don't recognize each individual piglet they just recognize the litter as a whole so she's not looking to she's not necessarily looking to squash one but she's not necessarily looking to um, get just one individual out of the way so um she try and gather them all um properly and and communicate with them as best she can um, so she, you can, she should be pretty good. They, they are pretty good, these, these rare breeds at being good mothers. You shouldn't need to sleep in the shed with them. But if she's comfortable and you're comfortable, then I'm not going to tell you not to. But just, you know, keep the disturbance factor um, as low as possible because it's, it is important for the, the different hormones around farrowing that she bonds with them. Thank I never you. give and just I... one word answers. Sorry. <laughs> no, we have an another a few more questions thank you for the questions we have a four-year-old boar plus a year old boar we're not running with the sows i would like love to have the boars together would you recommend keeping them separate mm. so that's a, a four-year-old and a year old i suspect there's quite a size difference there and as the four-year-old maybe this person is it can you um can you unmute yourself cara is this Big boar got big old teeth. I'll unmute Carla. It might be because I'm still sharing my screen. If I stop sharing, that might help. But oh. unless she's she's gone off. <laughs> um, should, I, should I stop um, sharing? I wonder if I need to change if I stop. Can you hear me? Yeah, Aha, here we go. Yeah, yeah, that was well, I, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I put both questions in about the integration of the gilts and the sows and the boars. Okay. Um, just to sort of take a wee step back. So the question about the gilts and the, so the sow is actually the mother of two of the gilts. Okay. Um, but there is an extra gilt in there that the, the street gilts are all the same age. Um, but the sow, um, like I say, she's the mother of two of them. So Again, you know, ideally I'd like to be running them as a pack almost. Yep. Um, and now that the, the gilts are at breeding age. Um, yeah. so, so that was my question about the integration of those. And then, yeah, so the four-year-old boar, he does have tusks. Um, mm -hmm. Well, one tusk. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's as, well, around us, he's absolutely as docile mm -hmm. as they come. It's like having a black Labrador running around the place. Um, and the younger boar, you know, he's just, you know, again, he's very playful and, uh, but yes, it is, you know, there is a big size difference. But um, like, so just now the four-year-old boar is on his own. The one-year-old is in with another pal, but unfortunately he's got a leg injury. So we're going to have to cull him um, yeah. in the next few days. So it's just, I don't want two boars almost not being able yeah. to have company. Yeah, so are they are they quite close to each other um, in with fence line contact to start off with? Are they? No, they're actually three miles apart. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so I think the first thing to do is to, if you want them to have them together, is to do a bit of a soft release to to try it out. I mean, it, if you find that, I, sorry, it's difficult without your setup. You know, if you've just I got know, paddocks and yeah. electric fence 
that's difficult and really an electric fence is not going to stop two boars wanting to no there so the the big boar the older boar he's out in roughly about sort of a hectare of woodland and rough grazing right and it's all rye lock okay so are you thinking about bringing the younger boy to him yes so it sounds like you've got plenty of space and if the younger boy wants to run away from the older boy he can and that it sounds like there's plenty of space to kind of integrate without injury the if the size difference is is significant the likelihood is the younger boar will just be submissive okay. but you i you know that's i don't take it from me that it, it's all going to be very individual um i wouldn't normally like to to mix um boars but when you have very big size differentiations they the the big boy is is usually just dominant without the little boy doing anything about it um ross you've worked with boars as well so feel free to to jump in if you want to here yeah the one thing there's nothing worse than two boars fighting yeah in a close close area what well, you don't know it's, it's quite trying. How do how you go between these two massive animals? You don't. You absolutely <laughs> exactly. don't. So you don't. You don't. that advice but, is, yeah. Yeah, you just can't. You, you, you've got one of the things, if they were in a close environment, try and get them into a bigger environment so one can at least run away. Um, it is a very difficult one. But uh, yeah. could we, we've got a few questions, still a few questions just to quickly go through. Yep. It's yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let me have um, let me have a bit more of a think about it as well, Cara. And um, uh, your space situation sounds good, but there's always a big risk when you mix boars, and certainly don't get in between them if you do decide to do it. <laughs> or vasectomise the young boar and put them pop him in with the, <laughs> the guilt. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, excellent. Thank you, Cara. And we've got a question here. How often do you need to change straw? Okay, so um, it's it depends on how dirty it is and in what what situation. So you can you can top up the bedding. You can kind of do like a deep litter system, add to it, and then every so often come through with um, if you've got a tractor or a, a scrape through and just li lift it out and clean out. It really does depend on how dirty it is, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. your uh, pigs will try and create latrines um, for themselves. They'll try and have a a dirty area and a clean area and they can keep their their straw very very clean when there's a ventilation issue and when the weather changes that's when they tend to dirty up the bit that you want them to lie in and things like that um when it comes so it's basically you you, you change it when it's when it's dirty with farring accommodation um you do need to keep on top of that because if the piglets start messing in there um you can get you know you can get scours and things like that if the placenta's in there and it's wet or when she's hot and she comes back in from wallowing and it's wet you do need to kind of keep that reasonably reasonably fresh although i'd say try not to disturb the nest site in the first couple of days of farrowing just take out things like the placenta or any muck just from the top surface but don't mess around with the bed because that is a big smell of piglets so she she recognizes the entire nest um so I, uh, yeah would you agree with me there ross I think? yeah yep. totally agree yeah that's a very good answer uh we've got a couple of people asking for the the slideshow this presentation has been recorded so it will be available <laughs> and the actual yeah. presentation uh, i'm sure we could maybe oh yeah that i out. can pop that yep that's great PDF of that excellent which breed of pig is the calmest this, this is uh this ah is no one. well you have to come back on october the 22nd <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i'll tell you a bit more about individual breeds um so i mean you you can you can i know i know breeds that are problematic you know pot bellied are pretty um opinionated um durox are very maternally defensive but great mothers um but just yeah. quite tricky to work with Tamworths are docile. Oxford Sandy and Blacks are pretty docile. Yeah, Car yeah. Carlos come back with large black calmest. Ah, uh, <laughs> oh, I think she might be advertising there. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's no, a really. Yeah, this is a good question for you, Emma. Okay. I got told I got told not to bed my two pegs 
they live outside, but to leave the bedding out for them to pull into the sty themselves. Is this right? Oh, okay. So you can do a bit of both. Um, I would bed up your sty, um, but they and then if they want to pull out the bedding, they will. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you certainly, if you, so that's for your two pigs, it, for farrowing pigs, again, I'm sorry I keep going back to it, but it is really, really important to manage your straw um, when you've got young young animals because they can get caught up in it and then the sow can crush them. You, you could put the bedding outside, but you might just end up wasting your bedding. Um, so I would suggest putting a little bit of bedding in the sty, a little bit out. They will take it in and they'll make their own bed as well. But um, I would, I don't think there's any problem with bedding up the sty. Yeah. And of course, I think it's just quite it's quite good fun to watch them make the bed. Maybe yeah, that's why you were advised to do it. <laughs> I know. I love seeing them with the the uh, straw in their mouth or grass because yeah. there's oh, pictures yeah. there. You saw them pulling the grass in, and they will do that on top yep, of they the will. straw. And, yeah, they will. It's, it's nice. But um, yeah, when you've got young, just to reiterate, when you've got young animals, when you've got farrowing, you can let them make the nest. But sometimes you have to go in there and act like a pig because they can be they can make nests that aren't very safe for the piglets so sometimes yeah. you have to bed up for them uh, let them nest build but also bed up for them a little bit as well right is straw best to use for bedding i see there's one coming in at the end there um yeah, yeah. yes it is so um or now i'm going to get this is it barley or wheat there's one that's softer than the other what uh barley's barley's the best yeah, as far as barley I, winter straw. barley, winter barley straw is, was always the best by far. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, it is best. They'll eat. They'll eat anything else really. They'll eat a bit of the straw as well. But um, yeah, that tends to be the best stuff, and it's quite it's sort of good for being absorbent and things like that. Oh, that was excellent. That's it. That's bang on an hour. That Look was, at that, everyone. Well done. Uh, Bit nervous about tonight, but thank you so much, and thank you for staying. The attendees have stayed. Oh, that's a quick question. Oh, okay. Could you use sheep's fleece as a byproduct for bedding? A she sheep's hmm. fleece. Oh well, that's one way of using sheep's fleece. <laughs> yeah. Because bless them, the sheep farmers aren't getting very much for their fleeces. Do you know? I don't. I don't know. Um, I would advise against it for piglets. I I think you stick to you know they'll get quite caught up in that. Um, but you know I that's I've never had that question and I no. think maybe you need to do a trial, Shirley, and let us know how <laughs> yeah. it goes. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a reason. I can't think of a reason that there would be a problem with that. But they'll probably try. It's whether they sort of eat it and. Yeah, would it, whether would it re kind of retain the moisture too much? It might do. I mean, if they're just using it yeah. and they actually use it as bedding, and they don't. Ah. The thing is, pigs manipulate everything. They're not just going to to quickly carry and and put yeah. down. They they salivate over everything. So it could be that you're right. It kind of retains the moisture. But in truth, I don't think either one of us know. No. <laughs> so. So we look forward to your feedback, Shirley, on that yeah. one. Good luck with that, and you could be on to a winner. Yeah, absolutely. This could be a this could be a business. <laughs> yeah. Emma, thank you so much for your time. Quite welcome. Uh, the the reaction has been superb. Thank you, yes, and sir. look forward to twenty second. But please join us again next week for veterinary and pig health with Hannah. Or you're very welcome. So. Take care. Yep. Have a good evening. Thank Have you. Have a good evening, folks. Cheerio. Bye.